Railway labor tensions. Hello everybody and welcome to the conversation. I'm David Schuster. As you may have heard, we were perhaps just a few days away from a national labor strike involving railway workers over the past couple of weeks. Uh, that has been averted since the Biden administration and Congress have essentially agreed to force a deal on the railway labor unions. Uh, the deal still does not include any paid sick leave. However, what does it all mean now? Joining us is Jason Greer. He is a labor expert, also the founder and president of Greer Consulting. Jason, thanks for being with us. So no labor strike, but is it possible that a lot of people now leave the railway industry? I don't know that they're gonna leave because it's pretty much all that they've known. I think what the bigger issue here is the fact that you have employees or union members who basically were given a contract that looks cash rich. But really, it's coming at the expense of them because you're looking at an industry that has not grown. You're looking at an industry that where the average worker is 45 years of age and they're not recruiting young people, they're not recruiting women, they're not recruiting ethnic minorities. So I don't think it's a case where these employees are going to leave so much as it is a case where if the employers don't start treating these employees better, it's an industry that's going to implode by its own actions. Imploding because I mean, it sounds like the railway workers, they have the leverage for the reasons you just cited. What do they do with that leverage? I mean, how does the industry implode? Is there another perhaps a threat of a work stoppage? Are there other issues that railway workers can put in play? Yeah, here's part of the challenge is they can threaten another strike. But what good is threatening a strike when Congress basically has the power to avert that strike just as we just saw? I think one of the things that they can do, and we see this happen in various unions, is they can do work slowdowns, if not work stoppages. They know, you know, here's the problem is when you tick off people who understand your systems, be prepared for those very people to do something to those systems to slow it down in order to make their point. So there's various uh, mechanisms, resources that they can utilize. The question is, are they going to do it? This reminds me of uh, many years ago, I was an assignment editor at Cable News Network. And um, and I was asked in the midst of all the controlling the crews and trying to make sure people are at the right place at the right time, I needed to pay more attention to the cost of office supplies. And so <laughs> to sort of send a message, I said, okay, I'm gonna pay, pay a lot of attention to the cost of office supplies. But as a result, everybody's gonna get overtime because I'm not gonna give them their meal penalties when they're supposed yeah. to. And as a result, I cost the company more money by trying to help them figure out how to stop with office supplies. It's sort of a maybe a silly example, but I imagine the same thing could be in play with railway workers. If anybody could cause a train to be late or cause a train to be delayed or perhaps have some issues moving along the tracks, it would be railway workers. And it seems like they're the ones who have the capacity to really drive up the cost if they want. They definitely have the capacity, they definitely have the know-how. But let's talk about one simple issue. Had you're talking about railroad companies that are up making upwards of a thousand percent more profit than they ever had before. Mm -hmm. And the biggest sticking point was simply giving 15 paid sick days. That's going to cost you nothing compared to the amount of money that you bring in. Had the companies just done right by these employees, we wouldn't even be talking about this in the first place. So I think it really comes down to Will they do these things? Maybe, I'm talking in terms of the union members potentially doing work slowdowns. But I think we really need to look at these railroad companies and ask the question of what are you going to start doing to make sure that these employees are taken care of? I've heard from a couple of people that the way the, 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 the possible two reasons, I guess, why the railroad companies have done what they've done. First, possible just greed. They simply just don't want to pay out the money. And secondly, uh, that there's a certain sort of level of efficiency that some people talk about with the railroad industry that if you have people taking sick days, then you start to ruin with the efficiency that is so dependent on making sure things get to the right place at the right time. Does that make sense? It does, it makes perfect sense because it's it's a very precise industry. The problem with it being so precise is the fact that they have not put in mechanisms that are necessarily going to allow for employees taking time off. So when you consider what happened over the global pandemic, meaning COVID, these workers were working overtime. They were working to the point where, you know, just listen to their families talk about the fact that they didn't see their they didn't see their loved ones for the better part of three to four weeks because they were working hand over fist. So I think it really comes down to the fact that railroad companies, through some mechanisms called autom automation, have the ability to make some wholesale changes within this industry that's going to benefit the workers while also benefiting the business. Have the railroad companies done a very good job, and it sounds like maybe no, but of training sort of the next generation? Because again, given that this is a very particular sort of business, I imagine mm -hmm. there's a lot of front end learning that needs to be done for people who are gonna work there. And it would seem to me like the responsibility is on the railroad companies to make sure there is a resupply of workers. 
I wish they used the old Bill Belichick model that for as great as Tom Brady is, I need to find the next Tom Brady because you never know what Tom Brady's going down with an injury. Same thing with the railroad companies. I think they've done a terrible job in terms of training and guiding the next generation of railroad workers. We only know this because they're not available. Again, I go back to the point that the average age of a railroad worker is 45 years old. That's a lot of years of their bodies being broken down, the mental fatigue, the emotional fatigue of the job. And if you don't bring that next generation on board, you're going to see, you know, forget what just happened in terms of the potential strike. You're going to see, again, an implosion that we're not ready for. What is it that Congress and the Biden administration or any administration could do to either incentivize the railroad companies to invest more in terms of getting new workers and training more people, or perhaps to punish them for not doing the right thing, like simply including this paid leave? If I'm advising Joe Biden, here's exactly what I say to President Biden. I would look at those railroad companies and say, I did you a solid this time because I wanted to avert a potential strike right before the holidays, but I'm not going to be there for you the next time. You get your ducks in a row and you get your house in order. You start taking care of these employees, you give them paid sick time, you make sure their health care coverage is great, not just adequate, is great because you can afford it. You take care of these folks because this is not just about your profit, this is about the American system. Because consider this, David, had a strike happen, we're talking about a $2 billion per day impact on the American economy. We cannot afford to get this wrong, but now the onus has to be on these companies to get it right. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, in order to put in 15 days of paid sick leave, that would have cost maybe $500 million to the industry? If that, if that, that's what gets me. You're making so much money, you're gonna make that money up next month. Just take care of the employees. But I think it also comes down to the fact that these railroad companies are basically, the entire industry is run how it was back in the 60s, where control was everything. But here's the nature of control. Control can corrupt. And unfortunately, it's corrupting these folks to the point where they can't see the impact that their actions are having for the employees that they basically make their lifeblood off of. What are some of the reasons that profits are up for the railroad industry? Getting that, the whole, you know, everyone keeps talking about the supply chain without people understanding what the supply chain really looks like. The reason why the uh, profits are up is because there's a greater demand for products, goods, and services across the country. That's a big reason. In effect, you have employees around various states, around various uh, cities who depend on Amtrak. They depend on trains to get them from point A to point B. So that's really, there's a higher demand and they are seizing on that demand. I thought I read somewhere that the railroad companies have also been able to make uh, to, to do more with less. I suppose you know increase their efficiency, but it feels like there comes a certain point where you go too far, where you're really stretching your personnel, your workers to the point of to the brink, and that seems like that could be dangerous. As much as it may be profitable, it can be dangerous. But COVID was sort of the great reckoning. You know, we talk about the fact that over the COVID era, it was sort of the year of the employee where employees were able to dictate what they wanted in terms of either, do I want to go back to work? Do I want to work remotely? Or what does my employment have to look like for me and for my family? But I think it was also the great reckoning, great reckoning for companies because they started to realize that as opposed to employing six people, now we can employ three people and get the work of six people out of those three people. Part of the challenge is when you have a system that's as physically intensive as the railroad system, you end up burning these folks out. Are the um, are the railroad lines getting longer as well? I mean, the number of cars uh, I've seen that well, a lot of companies now are have sort of this idea of well, if we can put a hundred you know railroad cars together, we can easily put two hundred railroad cars together with the same number of staff. Absolutely, because they understand that they, now we can maximize our profit. We can maximize our profit because you have clearly shown, and I'm talking about the employees, you've clearly shown that you're going to make sure that our products, goods, and services get out, even if there's only two of you doing it. Where do you see these tensions going over the next couple of months, Jason? I think it's going to die down because it's the unfortunate nature of society is that we you know, we grieve quickly and then we move on to the next thing to grieve. So I think it's gonna die down because the public's no longer really talking about it because the strike was averted. People are going to get their GI Joe with the Kung Fu grip, you know, for their kids and all that great stuff. But I think what we need to really look at is where are we going in terms of labor relations for the future? Because this was a prime case, a prime example of unions being in the forefront of the media. 
people were talking about it. And unfortunately, Congress clipped their wings. So I think what we're going to need to really pay attention to is how do we go about strengthening certain collective bargaining agreements so that the workers are taken care of? In other words, I mean, it may have been bad for the railroad workers today. It could be bad for other unions tomorrow, the next week, if Joe Biden continues sort of on this path of essentially, you know, not busting the unions, but essentially, as you mentioned, clipping their wings, forcing them into deals that the workers may not want. Well, Joe Biden campaigned on the fact that he was going to be the most pro-union president that we've ever seen before. And unfortunately for Mr. Biden, when the opportunity came up, came for you to actually take care of the unions, you didn't. Was it politically smart? Sure. But was it smart in terms of what it's going to do to your base, which is largely unions? I don't think so. I think it's a classic case of you know, we live in this world sort of a black and white where you're either right or you're wrong, but sometimes we have to live in this world of gray. I have worked in many situations in which unions have not been good for particular employers and they've been good for other employers. So I think it just makes sense that we need to start taking a better look at what is gonna happen going forward. Jason Greer is the founder and president of Greer Consulting. He is also an expert in all things involving labor relations. And so I guess, you know, good news. The good news is in the meantime, you know, there's no labor strike. We can all get from point A to point B on rail and all those presents and everything in the holiday season, they will be in the stores. The bad news is this could be a rough couple of months or years ahead for the for the railway workers. Absolutely. Absolutely. But God bless them and God bless their families. Yeah. Jason, thanks so much for doing this. Jason Greer, we appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me.